Christians need preaching. Amen. 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 Paul preached unto them. They weren't lost. Ready to depart on the morrow and continued his speech until midnight. Oh, Lord. And there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together. And there sat in a window a certain young man named Eutychus being fallen into a deep sleep. That boy needs revival. And as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. Killed him. And Paul went down and fell on him and embracing him said, Trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. When he therefore was come up again and had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till break of day, so he departed. Verse number 12, And they brought the young man alive and were not a little comforted. You know what that means? They had a shouting hallelujah time. They were not a little comforted. I want to use this story this morning, preach an old message I used to preach many, many years ago. It's entitled, A Long-Winded Preacher, A Dead Church Member, and a Great Revival. Here in this story this morning, we see all three of these things. You remember that the book of Acts is called like the Acts, A-X-E, of the apostle, where they laid the Acts of the Word of God to the trees of tradition and God uh, went from a, a traditional book. The book of Acts is a traditional book. Don't ever forget that. Uh, it's, trans, it's like a bridge going from Old Testament to New Testament, going from law to grace, going from Jew to Gentile in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So remember the book of Acts. The book of Acts is a very dangerous place to base your basic doctrine because there's so much changing going through there. In the, it's it's a progressive revelation through there. So you have to be careful. A lot of false doctrines come from people not understanding and rightly dividing the book of Acts. Now, in this story this morning, uh, we see a long-winded preacher, which you're hoping I'm not. Uh, we see a dead church member, which I'm hoping you're not. And we see a great revival, which all of us would like to see. Ain't that right? In this story this morning, they were in this, in this like a barn. They didn't have church buildings like we have back then. So they're in like a, like a third-story loft of a barn. And all these Christians were packed in there that, that night, and Paul started preaching. And he preached so long. I don't know what time he got started, uh, but he, he preached so long that this boy named Eutychus, who was sitting in the window, fell out and it killed him. And uh, that's a picture of a dead church member, church members who need a revival, like many of you sitting right here this morning. You're dead, but yet you walk. You're the walking dead, brother. That's the way most churches are the walking dead Baptist. That's right. I mean, your eyes are open, but you're asleep. You know what I mean? And then we see as they go down and God puts life back into that boy's body and he comes back. I want to tell you this story this morning and uh, uh, with a little old-fashioned southern redneck twist to it. And uh, we'll get to hear what God wants us to see. First of all, this morning, we see a long-winded preacher. Oh, my God, that's your worst nightmare, ain't it? Uh, I, I'm telling you what, he, I, I didn't write it. I, my job just to preach it. I mean, old Paul, he got up there that night, and he got up and he said, I'll tell you one thing, ha, ha, brethren. Ha. And boy, he kicked in about 7.30 or 8 o'clock, and about 8.15, he said, and that's my introduction. And then about 9 o'clock, he said, and secondly. And then and about 10 o'clock, he said, and thirdly. And fourthly, and fifthly, and sixthly, and seventhly. I, I know your favorite part. Your favorite part is when he says, and lastly. I don't mean nothing. You had that when preachers just say that to keep you listening. I, I mean, he oh, he comes down there, buddy, and he's uh, letting it rip. And I mean, it's 1030. It's 11 o'clock. It's 1130. It's 12 o'clock at night. Paul was a long, <laughs> I'd like to heard that sermon, wouldn't you? Lord have mercy. You know what? Now, I'm going to talk. What made Paul a long-winded preacher? You know what made Paul a long-winded preacher? By the way, I don't listen. I don't mind listening to a man preach pretty long if he says something. <laughs> what kills you is when they stay up here rah, 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 like a broke record and stay forever, and you about die, and they don't never say nothing. Uh, but if Paul was a long-winded preacher. You know why he was long? I tell you, because he had a definite 
message from God. The man had something to say. And buddy, he had a different experience with the Lord. You see, back there um, in a little bit before this, Paul was on the road to Damascus. And the Bible said he had... Christians hailed him, put him in jail, had Christians killed. He was a wicked, evil man. He hated Christianity. He was a very educated religious man, and they hate Christianity worse than anybody. And, buddy, he was going on the road to Damascus, and all of a sudden, there's a light come in the sky, brighter than the sun, and knocked him down. And Paul said, Who, what? and the Lord said, Paul, he said, I'm Jesus, whom thou persecutest. And Paul looked at him, and he said, Lord, uh, what, what do you want me to do? He said, I want you to go preach. Long story short, and Paul came in preaching. Uh, some old professor at a liberal college said that Paul just got out there in the desert, you know, and it was hot, and he, he had a sunstroke. Now, he had a sunstroke, all right. The S-O-N, son of God, knocked him down, changed his life, and brother, he came in preaching the faith that he had once destroyed. And the Bible said, old Paul got up there. He said, listen, he said, you people may not believe in him, but I met him. He's real. He's real to me. Paul had a definite message from God. And what our generation needs more than anything in the world is some preachers that will have a definite word and message from God and deliver it. That's what made him a long-winded preacher. He sure did, buddy. I'm telling you something. It's not like that old liberal preacher. That old liberal preacher they said one time, he's out walking on the beach one, one morning real early. And he's out walking. And a man was out there drowning. And going down like this and he stopped and said yes I see that hand and he went on down. He had nothing to offer. Had absolutely nothing to offer him. He was a long-winded preacher. He, I'm telling you, brother, he let her rip. Much unlike our preachers today. I don't. I try not to be critical. If a man's trying to preach for God, I got nothing, no problem with him. I pray for all God's men. I don't think everybody has to act like I act. I don't. I don't think you have to. I'm, I do this because it comes natural to me. I'm not putting on. I'm, not, I'm doing exactly what I'm doing. So you know, a preacher don't have to do just like I do. I don't think that at all. But there's something bad wrong with our generation uh, of preachers. Something missing. Something's missing in our generation. It seems like education and knowledge has, uh, the ministry has turned into a thing where that uh, only the elite can understand. That's a dangerous thing, the way to be. Brother Mike mentioned it a minute ago about getting in your Bible. Uh, uh, you should get in your Bible and know what the Bible says about any subject. You should know that. Study it. Learn it. Uh, our generation of preachers, uh, I'm telling you people, they, they, they learn the trade language. And what trade language is, is all professionals learn a trade language to keep the customer in the dark so that you know more than them and charge them money, basically. Uh, the trade language is like this. Man goes to the doctor and he's hurting like this. And the doctor says this. Lipotropic activity simultaneously minimize the possibility of gastric irritation due to vascular infirmities. But for the methionic synergistically potent, it must be converted into vivo because it contains an emulsifying faction. You know what he said? You have a bellyache, take this pill. But you can't, that's what I call the trade language. You can't charge a man $150 for saying, here, you take this pill for a bellyache. So you learn a bunch of words that the customer don't know. And that's why this stuff of Greek and Hebrew and stuff, it's got a whole generation of Christians saying, we're just dumb. We can't understand the Bible. Dr. So-and-so will tell us what it really means. It, it, it's, it's the wrong approach, people. It's the wrong approach. It's the wrong approach. You don't learn a trade language. Let me give you this one. Regardless, listen to this. Uh, a, a, a professor would say this. Regardless of their pigmentation, under normal illumination, felines of all species have been observed as scenarios when the atmosphere is enveloped in tenebrosity. That means all cats look gray at night. <laughs> but you see, you got to go to school to learn that. But anybody in the right mind wouldn't, wouldn't know that anyway. I worry about our mind. Let me quote you some preachers. Let me quote you some famous preachers. Brethren, quote, Unless you repent in a measure and be converted as it were, you will, I regret to say, be damned to some extent. And that's some of the hard preaching we got nowadays. You know what the old preachers used to say? If you don't get saved, you'll go to hell without God. 
You see the difference? They say, that's what Paul had a definite message from God. I heard a guy on the radio one day, driving up the road of here, from, from over in Black Mountain, and he said on there, Brethren, we should seek to please Christ, lest we be ashamed at the bema. And I was driving up the road, and I thought, I wonder how many people out here listening to that knows what in the world the bema is. How many of you people in here know what the bema is? Did you raise your hand, please? You're, okay. That's the judgment seat of Christ. Wouldn't it be a lot better for people to hear the judgment day? You know what that guy's doing? He's trying to impress people with his, uh, with his education. That's a dangerous way to breathe. I'm not against it. I'm not against knowing stuff. But you got to keep it down where the kids can get it. you got to put, the, you gotta put the, the, the food on the shelf, not just for giraffes, but for the, the little people and the normal people to get it. Paul had a definite message from God. One guy said, we must run with perseverance. Run with patience. Isn't that a little easier to understand? King James, they're starting to sound like psychiatrists. They're starting to sound like counselors instead of preachers. Our generation is starving. Sometimes people come here for the first time, and I start preaching, and they think, whoa. And they, oh, my goodness, it's a lot softer at our church, preacher. And our generation is starving for authoritative preaching, authoritative Bible preaching. Not a smart aleck know-it-all, not some big holier than thou, but you preach the Word with authority because there's something behind it, and that's the Holy Ghost of God. These modern preachers just can't get it. One guy got on and he said, uh, uh, John the Immersionist, you know, because they, they don't believe you should translate Baptist. They believe it should be uh, left immersionist because Baptist means immerse. And uh, they say, we're wrong. So we should all start saying this is Shining Light Immersionist Church. And uh, uh, what kind of church you go to? I go to an immersionist church. I think Baptist might be. They're the ones that always want to change hell into Sheol or Hades or something like that. Ask the average guy on the street what Sheol is. He has no clue. Ask him what hell is. He knows. I'm telling you, Brother Paul was a definite man of God and had a definite message from the Lord. Amen. He sure did. Like I said this, I'll give you one more right quick. He said, uh, a guy got up and he said, um, a trio of sightless rodents. This is three blind mice, three blind mice. See how they run, see how they run. They all run after the farmer's wife, cut off the tail with a carving knife. Have you ever seen such sight in your life? He says, a trio of sightless rodents. A trio of sightless rodents. Proceed the unusual manner in which they proceed to scamper about. Proceed the unusual manner in which they proceed to scamper about. They all pursued the agriculturalist spouse who endeavored to sever their extremities with a carving utensil. In all your natural born days of existence, have you ever perceived such an unusual phenomenon as a trio of silence? Oh, shut up, man. Uh, who are you trying to kid? Three blind mice, three blind mice. That's three stooges. Uh, oh, that's theme song. Hey, man, I'm telling you something, ladies and gentlemen. It's a, it's a disgrace. You go, we're not, I'm not up here to impress you. I'm up here to say, thus saith the Lord. Paul was definite. He had a definite message from God. Let me contrast that with the old country preachers. I know people make fun of old country preachers. Uh, people make fun of old hacking Baptist mountain preachers. I love it. I love it. I don't do it, but I love to hear them, buddy. You know what, I, you know what I've learned back years and years ago about old-fashioned preachers? There's a difference between a man going up on the, on the mountain and staying about a day or two or out in the barn somewhere with a, nothing but a bottle of water and a Bible when he comes back to preach, there's a big difference in that. That man will have a message from God. They may not have been able to, like some of them couldn't even pronounce the words right. And some of them was off a little bit. But the Lord made them wind up right anyway, most of the time. You've heard me say that before. I mean, they talk about, they, I don't want old, bad, old preacher, he got up and he said, I'll tell you right now, he said, that oyster man, uh, that old, hey, he was a, he was a hard and oyster man. Uh, most of y'all don't even know what I'm talking about. And uh, they say, hey, old printer, preacher, he said the salt has lost his savior, uh, so he ain't no good. And that ain't really what that means, but he talked about you now them partridges, that partridge David, and the partridge Abraham, and the part patriarch. Uh, they didn't have, just cause a man don't have it exactly like right, don't sit there and judge him. He may have something from God you might need to hear. Yes, sir. I, I learned a long time ago, don't cut them old-fashioned preachers short. They're liable to have a message from God for you. But they'll get in your heart where nobody can see but you and God because they have a definite message 
from the Lord. Amen. Well, old guy got up and he said, he said, now I'll tell you right now. He said, we're going to have to fight against the willies of the devil. Now the devil has a lot of them willies and you got to fight and just stand and and be, you know, that's funny about that. He, he said, uh, he got up there and he said, uh, they buried Jesus and they laid him in that sepulcher. And they, them sepulchers was hard to make. He said, them sepulchers, they had to chisel them. And every, I like that. He, he, he was good preaching, uh, but he, he was off a little bit, but he still done some mighty good preaching. One guy got up and he said, uh, he said, now you got to watch out for them scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees. He said, them was some mean people. That's true. That's the truth. And, and uh, uh, by, by the way, by the way, let me tell you something this, this morning. This preaching business ain't really as easy as some of you people think it is. We got these experts on preachers. Boy, I've met them. It's hard to keep a right spirit towards them. All, every time I meet them, well, Brother Danny, you said this, and you said, and I've heard you tell that story before. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you probably have. I, I'd like to get you up here a couple of Sundays and give you a wang at this and see how you do. I mean, let's see you look at all these faces and somebody picking their nose and somebody asleep and somebody messing with the baby and somebody checking their phone and then try to keep your thoughts right. And you, you see, what, what you don't realize is uh, when I'm up here preaching, I'm, I'm, I'm just typing it in here and it comes out here. Like a sentence ahead, you, can, you don't just get up here and blah, 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 blabber off like that. It comes in here, types it in, comes out here. And you've got to keep the train of thought. Keep, it, it, ain't, it, ain't, it ain't as easy as you think. You can get your tang tangled up real Easy. Easy. I've always been afraid that I'd be up here preaching and say, you know, say something awful bad. It's, it's never happened. I've come mighty close. I, I, but, I mean, you can't do this thousands and thousands of hours without the, there's many a slip, twixt tongue and lip, right? Many a slip, twixt tongue and lip. Sometimes you get up here, and, I mean, you, you, get, you get it all, all backwards. I, I like that preacher. He got up one Sunday morning in the building. He said, Woo! He said, people, this is great in here. He said, if the Lord keeps a blessing, we're going to have to dig a builder biggin'. And he said, he said we're, it's easy to do that. Have mercy on us, people. If you, I dare you, go out in your yard tomorrow afternoon and jump around and scream and holler for 45 minutes. Dare you. Try it. So you'd have a heart attack, some of you. I'm telling you, have mercy on the man uh, up here trying to preach. It's a whole lot harder than, than you might think. I like the guy got up and he said, uh, and now we see that Jonah was down in the bales welling. And, and people started laughing and he realized what he had done. He said, uh, uh, oh, excuse me. He said, I meant to say the bales welling. <laughs> Still said it wrong. And he said, excuse me, folks. What I really meant was the welly of the bell. <laughs> they never did get it right. And the best thing to do is when you mess up, just act like you don't even know it and keep going. <laughs> you done blew it then, brother. I mean, everybody doesn't like The guy got up one time and he said, uh, he said, I'm telling you what, uh, uh, right now, he said, glory to God. He said, the oh, church of God preacher got up and he said, whoo! He said, the Lord called us to cast out the sick, heal the dead, and raise the devil. He said, let's go and do what God wants us to do. That's why he's a long-winded preacher. He is a long-winded preacher, amen. Like an usher came to a lady one time, he said, excuse me, ma'am, you're occupying the wrong pie. May I sew you to another sheet? <laughs> that was rough. <laughs> uh, look, sometimes it, it comes out sideways. Sometimes it comes out backwards. But Paul got with God and got with the Lord. I'm not against saying the words right. I'm not against pronouncing all the syllables. But you've got to have a definite message from God. Ladies and gentlemen, he was long. He was long because he would soon be departing. The Bible said, ready to depart on the morrow. Paul looked at that crowd that night and he said, this may be the last time I ever see you. Nothing will hurt and burden a pastor's heart like said, we got people in here that may never live to see next Sunday. My, what a burden he had. And then, because he's just long, I mean, that was just his style. I don't know. I mean, when he said finally, brother, and he just got his second win. I mean, you did when you come to hear him preach, you didn't bring your watch, you brought your calendar. He'd take you in tomorrow sometime uh, till 12 o'clock midnight. You'd be saying, I want Brother Danny back uh, uh, for too long of listening to that. I guarantee you that, brother. I'm telling you, he was just long. He was just long. Like that guy said one time, this guy, he preached, he preached, he preached, preached, preached. Lord have mercy. He didn't think he's ever going to quit. And uh, 
he went out that morning and a lady shook his hand. She said, Pastor, your, your sermon this morning reminded me so much of the peace and mercy of God. He said, well, thank you, ma'am. How's that? She said, it passed all understanding, and I thought it would endure forever. <laughs> I said, okay, thank you very much. Well, I got guy, this one time, guy got up, he preached, and he preached, and he preached, and I didn't think he was ever going to hush. And about this time, this guy got up back yonder and started walking out the door, and he said, hey, where are you going? And that guy turned around and said, get a haircut. <laughs> he, turned, he said, why didn't you go before you would come? He said, I did. That's bad, uh, that's a long one. But I'm telling you, he was a long-winded preacher. Secondly, this morning, let me say hurriedly, we see a dead church member. Now, the whole story centers around this boy named Eutychus. The word Eutychus, I looked it up. It says, I, did, I preached it for years before I looked it up. It means one who had good fortune. I always thought it meant Eutychus too if you'd have fell out the window and broke your neck. But, but his name was here as Ludicus, and Eutychus, and he, and, he, and, he, and he fell out the window, and it killed him. He went to sleep and fell out. Now, that sleep that Eutychus went to is a picture of a Christian in church serving God that just gradually goes to sleep. And Eutychus sitting in a window, and we don't have a, I guess I'll use this window here. Here's where he was sitting, and he was sitting, uh, Oh, I don't know. Maybe, I, maybe I'll use this, this, this part of this window. He was sitting up here, and old Paul was just a preaching up a storm, and he was sitting there, and boy, I mean, he was into it. Hey, bam, Paul. <laughs> Woo! That's right, brother. Paul would say something good. He'd jump up and say, shuck the corn, preacher. Come on. Hey, man, cut the mustard, hey, man. That's what they all used to say. Some of y'all don't know what that means either. That's what they used to say when the preacher was preaching good. He'd cut the mustard. And he said, Paul, you let her rip, son. Glory to God. Hey, man, thank you, Paul. I mean, he'd done that for about the first hour and a half. And then about 45 minutes later, he said, right, brother. Just like some of you used to do. And then about 15 minutes later, glory. Oh, yeah. And then he's like this. And just like some of y'all used to do. Oh, you remember when you used to raise your hand? Remember when you was all excited? Now you're, uh, the devil done choked you out. You say, why we need revival, preacher? Because half of God's people is asleep. Amen. He went to sleep. Now I'm going to tell you, I'm going to make an honest confession. It used to really bother me when people went to sleep when I was preaching. I'd aggravate the fire out of me. And I'm just, God, I must be boring. I must be terrible. I can't even keep Frank awake. There he is. Amen, Brother Frank. Get over where you're supposed to be. And uh, he, uh, uh, I used to think, good night. I used to have people that went to sleep every Sunday. I had this one guy. He sat right in here. I believe that's him right there this morning. And, and he, every Sunday, every Sunday, I wouldn't doubt it. I, I, every Sunday, I'd start preaching, and he'd go like this. And his eyes would roll back. God, I could make the fire out of me. Look like he's demon possessed. And, and I would look across this way and look this way and jump over him and look this way. So I wouldn't have to look at him. And that used to aggravate me. I thought, I'm, I must be the worst preacher in the whole world. People sat there and go, and then I read where they went to sleep when Paul was preaching. I said, thank God. Surely I ain't that bad after all. They went to sleep on Paul. Uh, I, I believe some people preach. Uh, if John Wesley's up here preaching. They'd go to sleep every Sunday. Never forget uh, J. Harold Smith, the classic story. He told the famous story when he pastored First Baptist Church of Fort Smith, Arkansas, many years ago. Great, big, distinguished, uh, influential church. And Dr. Smith's up preaching. And he said he had... Uh, they had pews right here in the middle. You know, they had seats here and then aisles down through there. He said he had this one old guy named John that went to sleep every single Sunday morning without, that. I mean, he said he'd read the scripture, get into his message, pray, whatever he's going to do. He said about 10 minutes into the message, old John, he said he'd start going like this, and then he'd go back like this, and then he'd go, out. Oh, he'd go, and just saw logs the rest of the service. Well, his wife, Orpah, old Christian woman, it embarrassed her to death. 
And she said, she said, what? Well, I, I, she couldn't preach. She said, what am I going to do, preacher? I said, he, he embarrasses me. He's over there. <laughs> you know, like a rotten church. Preacher said, I'll tell you what you do. He's just kidding. He said, Orpha, you go down there to the grocery store and you buy you a big old chunk of that Limburger cheese and let it, let it rot. It stinks worse than a dead dog. He said, you wrap it up, put it in your pocketbook, and whenever he starts that Sunday morning, you just get it out and wave it a time or two in, in front of his nose like that. And he's just kidding, but Orpha did it. She went to the store, bought a pack of that cheese like that, put it in, in cellophane, wrapped it up, stuck it in her pocketbook, and waited till Sunday. Sure enough, Sunday came. I mean, old preacher got up, read his scripture, started preaching. Old John went into his act, just like every Sunday. He's out. He said he's up preaching. He saw Orpah digging in her pocketbook. He looked and said, oh, my God, what is she doing? Sure enough, she opened that cheese. She thought like that. She peeled it this way. And there's old John like that, and she just went, wait a minute. He jerked like that. She pulled it back this way again. He jerked again. She held it there, and all of a sudden, John hollers out right in the service, Arva, Arva, turn around. Your feet's in my face. <laughs> he didn't know where he was at. Now listen, that, that's funny, but you hear me this morning. There's a lot of people sitting in church every Sunday morning. They have no clue. They don't listen. They don't pay attention. You give them $1,000 when church is over, they couldn't even tell you what the preacher preached on. Is that you? Are you asleep? You can't sleep with your eyes open. I've seen people do it. It's weird, that's weird. I mean, that's scary. But people can do it. Like dead people. And, and, and oh, he, he, that's like a little fellow one time, you heard me tell this. He said, uh, uh, said, preachers don't talk in their sleep. They talk in other people's sleep. And one church had to start serving coffee after church. Get everybody woke up enough to come up, go home. And uh, he was, he was uh, preaching. And this guy, this old man, he went to church. He went to sleep every service. And the preacher called little Johnny over. He said, now listen, son. He said, I'm going to give you a dime every Sunday if you'll keep Papa awake. He said, okay, okay. He did pretty good there for a few Sundays. Papa would start going to sleep, and he'd punch him in the ribs, you know, pinch him, pull hair on his leg. And finally, he got to where Papa was sleeping again every Sunday. Preacher called him over, and he said, no, I ain't going to give you a dime no more if, you don't, if Papa was sleeping. He said, Papa, I'll give me 15 cents to let him sleep. <laughs> now listen, there's some of you like that. Leave me alone. Don't wake me up. I'm, I'm like life like it is, preacher. I don't want no revival and all that. Just leave me alone. Let me just enjoy life like I'm doing it. You've gone to sleep. Remember when the Lord was your first thought in the morning. The Bible was the first book you read. Your knees hit the floor and you called on the Lord and you walked with him and talked with him. And listen, that was him when the service started. But he fell out and was dead. Fell out and was dead. So he's like this. And he's like this. And he's up here like this. And he goes to sleep. And finally, nobody heard a peep out of him for about an hour. And about that time, plop, his feet <laughs> fell in the baptistry. Uh, but he fell out the third loft. Bam. Down there in the weeds. He got out. Now quickly, let me say this. Why did he fall out? You say, Brother Danny, he fell out because he went to sleep. Nope. That's why he fell. Why did he fall out? He fell out because there was more of him hanging out than there was hanging in. Right? If he'd have been right here, he'd have just fell on the floor. But the reason he fell out is because he had more of him out that way out he went. Now let me tell you something this morning. Everybody goes through times when we get a little cold on God. Everybody goes through times where we're not as fired up like we should. But you better not get stay too close to the edge because that's when you'll fall out. 
I know people like that. I know people, here's living right, here's sinning, and they get just as close to that world as they can. I want, I want to dress, I want to act, I want to listen to, just as close as I can without sin. That's a dangerous way to live. You better just get in way over here so that when you fall, one of your brethren kick you and wake you up, you'll fall out. I'm telling you, there'd be, there'd be a thousand people here this morning if they had listened to what I'm preaching to you today. They let themselves go to sleep. You say, you say, here's the way it goes. You start missing Wednesday night, then you start missing Sunday night. Then you start missing Sunday school. And then it's one hour a week. And then the next thing you know, you don't miss that for something. And the next thing you know, you miss. That's the bad thing about this coronavirus stuff and everything. And I know, I know we got to take precautions and all that. And I ain't fussing at nobody. But listen, people, we need God. We need church. We need the Lord. I'm telling you, we need the Lord. We need the Lord. I'm telling you, we need to stay in, not fall out around the edge. So this guy, one time, he's offering people a job. And uh, it was riding a horse around a dangerous mountain. And he went around this mountain like this. And uh, one guy came in. He said, I'm your man. Hire me. He said, how's that? He said, he said, I can get that close to that edge and never fall off one time. He said, okay, sit down. Next guy come in. He said, look, I'm the best horse rider in the world. He said, I can get that close to that edge and never go off one time. He said, okay, sit down. Next fellow come in and said, he said, sir, I'm, I'm, I don't really trust my driving that much. He said, I do the best I can, but I stay as far away from that edge as I can get. He said, you're hired. You got the job. I don't want somebody that plays around like that. See that? That's what will happen to you. You fool around. You fool around. You hang around with people who don't go to church and live for, live for God. You think you can play around. Watch dirty movies, well, mess around, drink alcohol, fool around. So I ain't no doubt in my mind these people in here this morning. You're like this. One day we'll look around and you ain't there. You'll be out. You'll be out. You say, well, preacher, okay, you better do whatever you got to do to stay in. Amen. He flopped out. About that time, his grandma was sitting right over here. And he went, ah, cute. He fell out the window. Well, Paul had to stop preaching. And that brings me to the third point. A great revival. Everybody went, oh, my goodness, the kid fell out the window. We're on the third floor. So that brings my third point, a great revival. Now look here. They all went visiting. Every one of them. Paul said, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We'll just stop right here. Everybody come on down. We're going to go hunt him. And so they all went down the steps, down the second floor, down the first floor. Out in the way. Lord, there's office weeds out there. I mean this high. There's blackberry vine, beggar lice, and Huckle, uh, cuckleburrs and everything else in the world out there. I mean, you know, briars and everything. And they said, How, where's he at? I don't know, but we got to find him. We gotta, and Memo was saying, find him. That's my grand boy. I don't want him out there dead somewhere. Paul, he's out. Preacher, preacher, let's go in. Preacher said, let's go get him. Let's go get him. And uh, that's what a real church does. When people get out, a real church don't say, well, I didn't, I didn't have no confidence in them to start with. I didn't think they was going to stay in. I always thought they was a hypocrite. That ain't right attitude. Our attitude is to pray and go find them and bring them back in. If it's your kin folks, that's what you'd want us to do. If it's my kin folks, I hope that's what you'd do. If it's ever me, I hope that's what you'd do. Don't I have, People have the worst attitude. If, 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 if anything that bothers me, it's people in church attitude towards somebody that falls. That's a terrible shame. It's liable to be you next time or some of your family, and you'll want people to show the same grace on you that you showed toward others. So they all went down there. There's a fighting through them weeds. And somebody said, there he is. There's his feet sticking up. And they went over there, and sure enough, there he laid on his back deader than four o'clock. He said, preacher, he was taken up as dead? No, he was dead. D-E-A-D, dead. Gone, out of this world. The Bible said the preacher, Paul, went and just fell on him like this and embraced him. And when he did, the Holy Ghost put life into him. Now look, everybody in here knows people that's out of church, right? Y'all know some young people that's out? You know some adults that's out? Try this. Tonight after service, go over to their house. Don't knock don't blow the horn. Just run in there and just fall right on top of them on the couch. 
<laughs> Amen. Well, send them text. That didn't work. Like Brandon, stand up, everybody. Now, y'all don't know this, but I can take him anytime I want to. <laughs> See how much bigger I am than this little punk right here? You take him, and you, you go to somebody's house tonight, Raj, Tish, and y'all go in there and just, if, if he wasn't dead, he'd be dead when he fell on him. <laughs> I'd finish him off right there, wouldn't it? But anyway, you go in there, and that guy, and about that time, Paul looked up and said, Hey, his life's in him. The Lord revived him. And he opened his eyes like that, and he helped him up. He said, Come on, you, get up, man. Get up. He gets up and he says, Oh, oh my neck is killing me. Whew, did kill me. He said, How'd I get down here in these weeds? Last thing I remember, you was on number 37. Boy, he was talking about something. Oh, how'd I get there? He said, Man, you fell out the window, dude. You died. And God put, a preacher come and brought us all down here and we visited you and, and you got well. He said, Really? I don't even remember if I, I don't remember. I, I thought I was doing pretty good. I don't, I don't remember. Lord, is that, is that true for so many people? These people sitting at home right now that don't even remember how they got out, people. They don't even remember what happened that got them out. Of, they just wake up one day and they don't go to church no more. They said, you're alive, son. Come on. That's what revival means. Revival means come back to life. And so he jumps up and says, whew, let's go. And he said, all right, you ready, buddy? Let's go. we got a service to finish up there. It was about 1230 at night by this time, in the morning, next morning. They led old Uticus up them steps, and he's going up through there like that, you know, and they give him a goodie powder, and he went on up there, and, and he, he got, got set back down, you know what I mean? Everybody got settled in. Everybody got settled in, and Apostle Paul got back up there, got his lights adjusted, had candles and, and, and lanterns burning around. He said, all right, now, where was I? Number 62, here I go. And Christ was, was in, uh, revealed in the Old Testament. And he kept preaching. About that time, somebody jumped up over here and said, Whoa, preacher, preacher, can I say something? He said, yes, ma'am, Grandma, you go right ahead. She said, I praise the Lord. She said, I praise the Lord for bringing you back in. She said, I was so burdened. Thank you, preacher. Thank you for having a burden for him. Thank you for going to visit him. He's back in. He's back in. Lord, they had all this time. Ever The Bible said they was not a little comforted. Lord, wouldn't you like to see that around shining light this week? Wouldn't you like to see Grandma shout? Wouldn't you like to see Mama's boys come home? Wouldn't you like to see marriages put back together? Wouldn't wouldn't you like to see old-fashioned Holy Ghost sin killing, heaven sent, devil stomping, revival? That's what they had that night. Amen. And old Paul just let him go ahead and say something there, and he said, "All right, I'm gonna go ahead and finish this sermon." About that time, you himself stands up, preacher. I say so. He said, "You go right ahead, son." He said, "I just want to thank you." Thank you, preacher, for caring about me. Thank you. I, I let myself slip out. I don't know how I got in there. He said, I thank my mom for praying for me, and I thank my church. And he said, I want to tell you, young people out here, don't ever sit over there in that chair right there. <laughs> he said, I don't know what he said. He, I bet he didn't sit there no more. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm telling him, he said, God's been good to me. God bless me. And the Bible said they were not a little comforted. Whew, would I like to see that? Revival is when God's people get woke up and then sinners will be saved and people will get right. One man put it like this and I close him. Come on, y'all. Revive thy work, O Lord. And manifest thy power. Come upon the church. Give a penitential shower. Revive thy work, O Lord, and make thy servants bold. Convict of sin and work once more as thou didst in days of old. Now there's two things the Holy Ghost will do when he's in a church service. And sadly, a lot of churches are missing one or both of these. He will bless the saints 
and he will convict the sinners. If all it is is a bunch of hooping and hollering, no conviction, it ain't the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost blesses the saints, and he'll reprove the world of sin, brother. The Holy Ghost, when he gets in church service, you start feeling nervous about your sins. I, I, don't, I don't agree with these churches. They say, oh, come to our church. We'll make you feel comfortable. If you're living in sin, you ain't supposed to feel comfortable in church. I wouldn't feel comfortable if you stuck me in a pool hall bar last night. And I'm not saying, you know what I mean. People should feel conviction when they walk in here. That's what got me saved. Conviction. And that's what we need. Let's pray. You've seen a long-winded preacher, a dead church member, and a great revival. I wonder how many people here this morning say, Preacher, I'm going to come meet my wife, my kids. How many teenagers say, I'm going to come and say, Lord, I sure would like to have an old-fashioned Holy Ghost revival for my friends and family, my own home. You come on right now. Father, do what ought to be done right now. God, send the penitential shower. And may the Holy Ghost come down and do a great work. We'll thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand this morning. Let's stand. Let's stand. We'll sing. Amen. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. Let's get in this altar this morning and pray for revival. Come on. Amen. Everybody. Amen. Come on now. Have thine own way. That's right. That's right. Let's just get down here and say, Lord, I want revival. I need revival. Come on. For our kids, for our grandkids, for our husbands, for our wives, for our marriages, for our home, for our country. We need revival. The will, while I am waiting, yielded and still. Let's come. Come on, everybody. Come on now. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Amen. That's right. That's right. That's what we need. Oh, Lord, wash me just now. As in thy presence, humbly I bow. One more. We're singing one more verse. This is for you. Don't wait, Lord, have thine own way. Can you say that this morning? You say, Lord, have your own way in my heart. Help me, I pray. Power, all power, surely is thine. Amen. Touch me and heal me, Savior divine. She's playing softly now while these are still praying. Now, school started. So a lot of the people that want to come to our revival are not going to be able to come like from Tennessee and Georgia and Alabama and stuff. So that means it's open for us. We're not going to be overcrowded. And this is for our church. This is for our church. I, other people are welcome. And there will be visitors. But this is for us. This is for us. Please, go home this evening. Find you a spot and pray. Get in this revival. Get in this revival. Maybe, maybe cancel an appointment or put something off till Thursday or Friday that you can do, your grass or whatever, and, and make, make plans to get in here. Uh, we're we're going to have the, the Edwards family tomorrow night. I'm up in Burnsville. The, the Duncan family will be here Tuesday night, Lord willing. Our Shining Light singers will be singing. And we're just really, really, really very excited about it. Okay? Amen. Uh, people ask me, and I forgot to mention a while ago, you, the, the, about giving, you can give at BiblePreaching.us, okay? Or Post Office Box 177, Nebo. P.O. Box 177, Nebo, North Carolina, 28761. 28761. Uh, for all you folks watching in other countries and wherever you're at. All right, we're going to be dismissed. We'll be here at 5 o'clock to sing. We need everybody that's in the choir and should be. Uh, we'll, we'll bunch up and different so it won't be close. And we're going to practice some songs for the revival. So let's do that tonight, okay? Amen. All right, every head bowed. We'll be dismissed. Be friendly. Don't everybody go out at the same time so you can stay apart. Go out these side doors or something. And that way, don't be on, breathing on each other and stuff. And uh, let's, uh, let's go this morning, okay? All right.